Welcome to another CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute. In today's CME episode, Dr. Andrew Cutler will be interviewing Dr. Laxman Baru about how to manage and treat psychosis in dementia. For complete CME information, please refer to this podcast description page or go to nei.global forward slash podcast. Let's listen in as Drs. Cutler and Baru discuss the current research on treating and managing dementia-related psychosis. Welcome, everyone, to this NEI podcast. Today's podcast is Dementia-Related Psychosis. I'm Dr. Andy Cutler, Chief Medical Officer of NEI, and it's really a pleasure to be here today with Dr. Laxman Baru, who's an NEI faculty member. Laxman, how are you? I'm well. I hope you're doing well, too. I am so far staying safe and healthy. Likewise. So we have a couple of objectives today. We're going to describe the clinical presentation of psychosis in dementia and learn how to employ pharmacologic treatment strategies to ameliorate psychosis in patients with dementia. So let's get started. Certainly, our mental health audience here has a sense of what psychosis is, I guess, or what it means. But what are we talking about when we talk about dementia-related psychosis? So dementia-related psychosis is really a little bit different than the typical psychosis that most uh, mental health professionals will see. We tend to have psychosis that is typically more hallucinations, visual hallucinations than the typical auditory hallucinations folks are used to seeing, a fair share of delusions. And the dynamics are different because it's an older population, and you tend to see it with advancing dementia kind of in varying degrees based on the type of dementia that you have. So between the family dynamics being different, you have you know, children involved who are now adults, spouses that are about the same age, patients that are increasingly more enfeebled by their dementia. So the dynamics are different. The presentations are very different. Well, I think you brought out a very important point, and that is the quality of the hallucinations tend to be more visual versus auditory, like we're used to seeing with schizophrenia. I think that's a very helpful tip. There are Four most common dementias I think it's helpful to talk about. We're talking about Alzheimer's disease with dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia. What do you know? I've got five there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> There's five of them. How Do the symptoms of psychosis differ amongst these different types Absolutely. of dementia? The one big factor is the prevalence is actually different. Not all dementias lead to equal amounts of psychosis. Lewy body dementia probably has the highest percentage. I'd probably say about three quarters of folks with Lewy body dementia will have mm-hmm. some form of psychosis. Parkinson's is next because Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia share some common pathologies. Lewy bodies are involved yeah. in both diseases. We yes. tend to see that in about 50 plus percent of patients with Parkinson's will have dementia mm-hmm. and with psychosis. So that's an important point to think about. So that's the second most common Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common dementia, really has about maybe I would say about a third or so, maybe pushing 40% of folks will have some form of uh, psychosis with it. Frontotemporal Mm -hmm. dementia actually is less common along with vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is about 15%. Frontotemporal dementia is about 5 to 10%. Now, So only 5 to 10%. Interesting. Exactly. Now, interesting thing is, while the numbers of psychosis and dementia are different, there's probably two factors that we should look at. The most common folks with dementia with psychosis is probably going to be Alzheimer's, in terms of sheer numbers, because Alzheimer's is such a more common dementia form Mm -hmm. than any of the other ones. So that's one to look at differently. Frontotemporal dementia is less common. And of course, these numbers are based on studies, and these studies may have under-recognized this. We've realized over the course of time that if people are monitored more frequently, the numbers of psychosis and dementia are much higher than we typically think, Mm -hmm. though we do expect frontotemporal dementia to be on the lower 5 to 10% side compared to some of the other ones. So it could be that the psychosis is unrecognized, you're saying? Correct. Yeah, I can imagine if somebody's quietly hallucinating, you may not know unless you ask. Interesting. So you mentioned the Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease. They are similar but not the same. Is that correct? Correct. From a diagnostic criteria, it's very similar to psychiatry criteria in terms of time. So the definition that differentiates Lewy body dementia from Parkinson's disease dementia is a one-year definition. If you developed Parkinsonian symptoms and dementia within a year, it's Lewy body. If you were separated by greater than a year, it's Parkinson's disease dementia. 
So really, right. your criteria depends on how good of a historian the patient is and when you happen to see the patient. Now, in my clinic, majority of my folks have Parkinson's disease first going on for years before they develop dementing process with Parkinson's disease. So no I question, see. Parkinson's disease and dementia. We get many of these folks that have had symptoms for such a long time, and family members give us this history of, well, they've had Parkinson's symptoms for five years, and they've had some cognitive issues. We're not sure if it rises to the level of dementia or not. And so the diagnosis is a little bit grayer in that sense, whether it's PDD or LBD, it tends to be a little mm-hmm. bit different. But at the same time, we treat them symptomatically as and when issues occur. I see. And I guess a very important point, we're going to talk about treatment a little later, but most of the medications, the antipsychotics we're going to use are dopamine blockers. And Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease obviously are exquisitely sensitive to dopamine blockade, correct? Absolutely. This was a major challenge for us on the Parkinson's disease side is that we would start talking about medications to treat the psychosis in dementia and then have to stop at that point and say, wait, we're having a problem because we're going to have difficulty with motor control. And I remember one of my training mentors telling me, once this develops, you must ask the patient point blank, do they want motor control or psychosis control? You won't be able Mm -hmm. to achieve either. And by treating Mm -hmm. one, we may make the other one worse. And so so we were in this bind with treating one or the other. Yeah. Okay, we'll get into treatment in just a minute. Before we do, I wanted to talk a little bit about the neuropathology. How does the neuropathology differ depending on the type of dementia, or does it differ? In some ways, it differs. We've realized over the course of time, there's probably multiple dementing processes. Many of them are common to the temporal lobe. We tend to think of Parkinson's disease dementia being a subcortical dementia, causing some frontal dysfunction in terms of executive function, and as well as short-term memory issues as well as occipital lobe dysfunction. Lewy body dementia tends to be much more of a temporal occipital dementia. Alzheimer's mm-hmm. tends to be much more of a temporal and uh, parietal dementia, and frontotemporal, as the name implies, is more frontal and temporal in that mm-hmm. sense. Over the course of time, the dementias tend to mingle together in a certain amount. They may start out differently, but as the dementia mm-hmm. progresses, they tend to be much more diffuse and involving multiple areas of the brain. The mm-hmm. thing we've known about individuals is we've seen dysfunction of the temporal lobe in individuals who tend to have more psychosis. EEGs have been abnormal in individuals over the temporal lobe in individuals who have uh, psychosis in the setting of dementia. So there must be some commonality of pathology with it. Mm-hmm. Though individual dementia start out separately and then coalesce to the more broader spread neurodegenerative pattern. Now, speaking of that, it's actually not uncommon to have mixed dementias, isn't it? Or to have more than one of these at the same time. It is. We've seen individuals, and and when you add pathology into this, pathology can really surprise you. Most of these diagnoses are based on phenomenology, the kind of type Mm -hmm. of presentation Mm -hmm. folks have. And there was Mm -hmm. a time when Alzheimer's has variations with frontotemporal variations as well. So there's mixing of those two. And we've seen individuals that have been diagnosed clinically with Lewy body dementia and then at the time of pathology, they found both Lewy body pathology as well as tauopathies, which are more suggestive of mm-hmm. temporal mm-hmm. and Alzheimer's. So pathology mm-hmm. becomes the final arbiter, though we're diagnosing folks based on kind of phenomenology and presentation. And particularly Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, I understand, frequently coexist. Absolutely. So vascular dementia exists on the vascular risk factors and is much more subcortical, whereas Alzheimer's is cortical, mm-hmm. and the two can coexist mm-hmm. very easily, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because we used to think of vascular dementia as a, more of a macrovascular where people have strokes, but we realize now there's a lot of microvascular pathology involved. Oh, absolutely. So the largest thought process was, you know, vascular dementia was also thought of in two different groups. Vascular dementia was, you know, you had a large uh, stroke-like lesion, which then led to a cognitive mm-hmm. impairment, and then progression from there onwards because you had a mm-hmm. sudden dropout of a certain amount of neurons. The mm-hmm. other more common likelihood is small vessel disease that continues to accrue over individuals who have risk factors of hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes. Mm-hmm. And with mm-hmm. that, you see this evolving picture of small vessel disease that doesn't lead to these overt symptoms of dementia that you might experience, mm-hmm. but results in more personality changes in walking, changes in behavior that are much more slow in accumulation than you would see from a larger stroke. And that stepwise classic vascular doesn't happen there. I see. Now let's talk a little bit about neuropathology on a more chemical level, neurotransmitter level. 
We know now that predominantly there are three neurotransmitters probably involved with psychosis, and you can sort of have a serotonin-based psychosis. Think about LSD, acid, for instance, which is especially overdriving the 5-HT2A serotonin receptors. You can have a glutamate psychosis. Think of PCP or angel dust, which we know is an NMDA receptor antagonist, or the classic dopamine psychosis that we think of as being underlying the pathology of schizophrenia, or if somebody does too much cocaine or methamphetamine. How about the neurotransmitters involved here? Is, are we talking about the same kinds of neurotransmitters? We suspect so. We, I think we're talking about some of the same neurotransmitters. If you think about it, in Parkinson's and Lewy body, we're looking at degeneration that occurs involving the serotonergic nervous system. Though we tend to think of these three neurotransmitters in categories, that they're really linked together where the serotonergic input drives yes. the dopaminergic and the dopaminergic input. So it's a yes. question of being up, exactly a question of being upstream or downstream. In some ways, neurocircuitries are all linked together, and we tend to think of it from that point of view. And it's interesting because the Parkinsonian issues, because of involvement in the dorsal raphe and the serotonergic projection mm -hmm. to the cortex, mm -hmm. are probably a culprit, which then of course feed the glutaminergic and the dopaminergic system. In yes. other forms of dementia, you may have more temporal lobe involvement. And the temporal lobe involvement involves the mesolimbic pathways, which psychiatrists have used for schizophrenia. So you tend to see a lot of these other factors with it. Mm -hmm. And my mm -hmm. suspicion is it's probably one of multiple systems. And as you see dementia advancing, it's probably a little difficult to say, is it system A or system B, knowing full well that affecting one circuitry impacts a second and a third one with downstream effects. Yeah, I think you said it well when you say these three systems interact quite a bit. We know, for instance... Again, back to those serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, they can live on pyramidal neurons, uh, glutamatergic pyramidal neurons in the cortex. And as you said, when you get some death of the Raffae nuclei, you get less serotonin and that those 5-HT2A receptors upregulate. And then you tend to overdrive glutamate, which then overdrives dopamine and so on. Absolutely. So and I think how really the circuitry works is very interesting that we've thought of these things differently, but they really are co acting or coordinated in some way. Right. Now, we're going to get into, again, back into the neurotransmitters when we talk about treatment, because we think some of our treatments work on some of these receptors. But before we do, how does dementia-related psychosis affect the family dynamics? Oh, this, is, this could be a whole topic unto itself. <laughs> family dynamics can be very, very different. So this is a big difference from the psychosis issues you may see in schizophrenia. Here you have older individuals being taken care of by other older individuals. Children may or may not be in the picture. There is a lot of conversation. There's a lot of hiding. There's a lot of embarrassment. So let's take it all piece by piece. It depends on the spouse, depends on the family. Some family members will suffer in silence to the extent you cannot imagine. They will suffer and suffer in silence knowing full well this is going on. They're embarrassed to bring this up to anyone. They have a fear that if they do, they'll be committed or Worse, because of some of the delusions that are present, more so delusions about either jealousy or paranoia that mm -hmm. tend to occur in, these, in this population, that they'll be embarrassed. No spouse wants to be accused of having an affair, knowing full mm -hmm. well the healthcare provider has a 50-50 chance of siding with the patient or siding with the spouse and believing them. Mm -hmm. um, nobody wants to be accused of poisoning their loved one either or stealing from them. So yes. many times they will suffer in silence. They will not bring it up. Many patients have been instructed before the visit not to bring it up. There have been times when we've seen individuals in the office and said, so do you see something that other people don't see? And they're like, no. Well, there is those times. And then immediately you can hear the almost the symbol uh, or from the family not to discuss that. And then that's it. No discussion will happen in the office from then on, no matter how much I probe. Yeah. And then I have to kind of approach it and say, if you see something, say something type situation and bring it up to the <laughs> right point. That's one aspect of the dynamic. So they will suffer in silence until they can't anymore. The others are very vocal about it. They're very bothered by this, that dad or mom is having these issues. They want it fixed. They wanted it fixed yesterday. And they didn't realize it was linked to their dementing process. So this right. for them is very different. And this was something that threw them a curveball something they're not used to and don't know how to manage it. Many children are also equally embarrassed and, and besides themselves on this issue as well. And the third is a lot of dynamics really get into the oppositional, which worries me a little bit because it brings about agitation in, in, in this population. Many of these mm -hmm. folks with dementia aren't typically the picture of an agitated patient. Mm 
unless they are brought to a certain point or if they have a encephalopathy secondary to the dementia. And many of these folks will get into this oppositional issue where their delusions are challenged or their hallucinations are challenged. And that becomes a major problem. And at some point, the challenging of the repeat challenging and denial of their hallucinations by the caregiver of the family results in them lashing out. So that is a different challenge in many ways. And of course, in in some situations, we have a lot of infighting in the family over how this should be managed, whether it should be addressed between the spouse and the children or between the sibling and, and the spouse. So this becomes a really tense dynamic. And I'm sorry to say, the holiday season is leading into us and this yes. time almost always will occur between now and into the winter when family members tend to be more sequestered, which is what's happening even in the COVID setting. The more family members are sequestered, the more these dynamics wor- work against them and for the worse. I can imagine how stressful it must be for a caretaker to be constantly accused of something, yeah. as you said, whether it's paranoid, jealous, whatever the, the delusion is. That, that's got to be really draining and demoralizing. Oh, absolutely. And this changes if they place the patient. Many folks will feel, family members will feel, well, if we just place this person, and get them out of the home situation, they will now no longer have those issues. Well, it follows them to the assisted living facility or to yes. the facility. And that's another difference from schizophrenia in many ways, where the caretakers are very much being accused of things. And this is a much more vulnerable population. And so now into the spouse stealing from the husband or spouse trying to poison the husband, it's now the caretaker at the facility. Mm-hmm. And now the biggest yes. problem is the spouse is sure he or he were not involved in this, but they're not so sure the facility person isn't doing that. So now that sets up yes. a bad dynamic between patient caregiver at the facility and family caregiver at the facility. So that makes the situation just more uh, fluid and uh, more complicated. Yes. So what advice do you have for caregivers when it comes to managing symptoms of dementia-related psychosis? So it goes back to what we talk about, which is if you start seeing these things, let us know early. We can help manage Mm -hmm. these things early. We can talk about educating. We can reassure you. We can evaluate you. We can work this up and say, is this due to the dementing process or is this due to a secondary process? The secondary Mm -hmm. process is very important from our point of view because we want to make sure there isn't an infection that's causing it. We want to make sure there's sure. no hydration, which is common in the older population. We want to be okay. worried about polypharmacy. So much iatrogenesis with polypharmacy of medications can cause it. Did you start a medication that resulted in Did you stop a medication then that then caused it? Aside from those things, we also want to make sure there isn't a structural lesion. Many of these folks with Parkinson's disease or even the older cognitively impaired dementia patients with other dementias can have a fall and can end up with a subdural hematoma, which can then oh the decline in their cognitive status and result in more hallucinations where there weren't as many. So we look for first, tell us when you see it, but not when things have gotten to a f- much more extreme situation. Mm-hmm. In other words, mm-hmm. the analogy that, that a colleague of mine gave me is, tell me when the barn is catching fire, not when the barn is fully on fire and the horses have run out, because I can do <laughs> less at that time. And I think that's, yes. that's a very true analogy of, where you should begin with this. If you see something, say something mm-hmm. up front so we can help evaluate for causes and then do a stepwise thing, room time for education and even time for management. But if you tell us after the fact, there's much less that we can do and you've set your own pattern in motion. I can imagine it would also be helpful, and I've done this before, to advise caregivers not to take things personally. Don't take it personally when the person accuses you of these things. And then also don't lock horns. You mentioned this earlier, when they get into, they're constantly confronting the patient. No, there isn't something there or no, we're not trying to do this to you. So I find sometimes that helps too. I I, I talk about it like bullfighting. You step out of the way with the flag. You don't stand there and let the bull gore you. (laughs) I like that. I I like that a lot. I'm going to use that in clinic. Uh, It's very Don't lock horns is exactly correct. And many times I say bypass them. So if they're seeing animals and sure, okay, so we'll take care of it in a different way. You have somebody who's really trying to involve themselves in a particular situation, find a different way. I'll give you a classic example of a person in clinic. He's never been aggressive before and probably never since. He saw a TV report of a child being harmed by a car in a hit and run. He was convinced Mm. that it was his grandson. Oh, my. So, of course, the wife called the house, confirmed that it was not her grandson. 
and then proceeded to have an oppositional conversation that went on for an hour or two about this. Yeah. And he kept trying to get the car keys and he kept trying to get to see the grandson. And he finally, he lo- it resulted in her being pushed and falling to the ground, breaking her wrist, going to the ER. Family oh came in and swooped in and interceded at that point. And that was a major issue for him and for her as well, for both of them. But as I pointed out, this is where locking horns gets you say, we called him, we're going to go see your grandson. Let's put the grandson on the video so you can see your grandson. You know, I can't find the car keys. There are multiple avenues of distract and redirect that you could do rather than locking horns, especially more conclusions. Yeah, I like that. Distract and redirect. Those are good techniques. What types of support groups or services are available for caregivers when it comes to DRP? This becomes a limiting option. There are dementia support groups out there, and they can help yes. manage some of the issues that the caregivers can congregate and talk about this. But specifically for do- dementia-related psychosis, there are less support groups specifically for that. Mm-hmm. Many times, as we talked about, this being a little bit more under-recognized, folks don't talk about it as much. And yes. many of times, this is recognized in much later stages where the patients are much more impacted and caregivers are not in any position to really travel. Now that may change, of course, in the COVID setting, many of these support groups are becoming virtual and maybe helpful to have these virtual meetings online like we do for so many of our Parkinson's patients. Now we've talked a little bit about some non-medication strategies, but what other kinds of non-medication interventions or strategies might we suggest? So some of the non-medication strategies, one, one of the things that we look at is can we make sure certain things are done well? So what I call daily hygiene things, make sure you have a regular time to get up, make sure you have a regular time to sleep, make sure you have regular mm-hmm. food intake. All of these mm-hmm. factors can throw off an older individual, whereas would not do that to a younger individual. Mm-hmm. And I've seen folks cognitively improve when they're in a more stimulated environment, when they exercise, when they stay active. And that's somebody that does not have, have dementia per se, but does have cognitive impairment. So Regular schedule, regular meal times, predictability in their day certainly helps folks with dementia. The other factor is because of the time we're heading into where the evenings are longer and it's getting darker earlier, folks mm-hmm. tend to start having more sundowning issues when the yes. sun goes down and the shadows are occurring and the shadows get misperceived. So it's not per se pure hallucinations, but it's really misinterpretation of visual stimuli, which can then mm-hmm. be passed. So I see a little bit of a tree and I don't shadowing in, and I don't think that's a tree. I think that's a person trying to harm me or so on yeah. and so forth. So, so some of that can be fed in with better light uh, as the evening mm-hmm. starts to occur. Now, the mm-hmm. flip side is we fix an issue, but we create a separate issue. And the separate issue that we create is now it's time to go to bed and you have these bright lights on. So what I mm-hmm. recommend is starting kind of lights around four o'clock or so in the evening time and then leaving the lights on till about an hour before bed at which point you want to go from having no shadows with lots of light to having no shadows with very little light so that they're not awake or misperceiving shadows in that sense. Yeah, those would be illusions as opposed to hallucinations where there's nothing there. Yeah, that's interesting. I can also imagine one of the things you would do is look for any kind of precipitants. And obviously a precipitant, you've talked about many different precipitants or conflicts or something in the environment that can be addressed or changed if there's a certain person or a certain sound or a certain time of day that a train goes by or the mailman comes or the dog barks, I guess those are things that could be looked for too. Triggers, I guess is what you would say. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you look for triggers, you increase the stimulation. So they're more engaged with things they enjoy doing, playing music, or whether that's in watching something on TV that they enjoy. But yes, even triggers such as distressing news, COVID has really caused a lot of distress in family members that has then been picked up by the person who has dementia-related psychosis, and they've internalized it. A year or two ago, actually more than a year or two ago, one of my patients with dementia-related psychosis felt very strongly that they were going to be attacked by North Korea in a nuclear strike. We live Mm -hmm. in the greater D.C. area, so that's reasonable. And certainly we were in conflict with North Korea, and there was a lot of discussion about nuclear capability. So that all of that got perceived into this delusion that then became fixed too much to the point that he was trying to get out of the house and drive oh, himself my. out. So you can see how one situation begat another situation, a safety situation mm-hmm. that became an issue of him driving on the road in his current state. Mm-hmm. So in that case, you would try to keep him away from the news. Exactly. Go to more pleasant things and away from news and distressing factors. 
Again, the distraction technique. Okay, let's talk about then pharmacologic treatments. What are the currently available pharmacologic treatments for DRP? So the currently available uh, treatments for DRP are limited. There are the current atypical first and second generation antipsychotics that we have, which leave us a little bit of a challenge and an unmet need for individuals. With Mm -hmm. these antipsychotics comes, of course, the boxed warning that we have for older individuals. This came out of a study about 10 years ago that looked at the boxed warning, and the boxed warning can be very uh, disturbing for family members and even patients in that sense. That's one. The other thing is the factor is that older individuals tend to be more susceptible to side effects. One of those side effects is sedation. For the Lewy body uh, dementia and the Parkinson's disease dementia population, it's a very big limiting factor from these first and second generation antipsychotics because of motor symptoms worsening. From the D2 blockade, dopamine receptor type 2 blockade. D2 blockade. And even the anticholinergic, antihistaminergic activities can cause more of the sedation issues. So family members now have taken dementia the patients going from hallucinations to now being sedated. And so mm-hmm. they've now gone from one end of the extreme to the other end of the extreme and are concerned what to do, then add into this the boxed warning and there's a lot of concerns. Now, certainly, on the Parkinson's disease psychosis side, we have a therapy that's an antipsychotic medication available that does not cause that, and that is pemobacerin. But that's for yes. Parkinson's disease uh, psychosis issues. At this point, yes. it's only for that. But I understand there is data available on pimavanserin for DRP. Absolutely. It's available, and we've seen this, some of the data out there. It comes from the Harmony study, and mm-hmm. the Harmony study looks at and dementia-related psychosis and pimavanserin's data, and it's actually quite promising. I understand that they are in the process of getting FDA approval but have not gotten it yet, and mm-hmm. it looks at a variety of different dementias out there. Yeah, exactly. That's what's so interesting. This phase three harmony study looked at psychosis related to any dementia. So dementia related psychosis, not just Alzheimer's dementia. And it uh, it was an interesting study design. They actually treated these patients with pimavanserin and those who responded then were either continued on pimavanserin or switched to placebo and they looked at the risk of relapse. And the data was quite positive. The risk of relapse of psychosis was actually decreased by 2.8 times, almost three times versus placebo. Yes, it was actually very interesting. And it was a very interesting study model. They treat, As you mentioned, they treated everybody with it. And then those who responded and responded by a significant amount, those who mm-hmm. showed good efficacy with this, and then were then grouped into two different groups, the placebo group and the active treatment group. And then they looked for basically remission or relapse. And I, I agree that relapse remission, and people had a 2.8-fold reduction in having relapse as opposed to the placebo group. And I think that was a great way to look at the study of looking at those who respond. And majority of the patients did respond and then be able to see, does it prevent you from having relapse? And it did. Now, you've mentioned that pimavanserin is considered an atypical antipsychotic. But what makes it different? How does it work? So I consider it atypical, and in that sense, it's different than other antipsychotics because if you look at first generations or second generations, many of these interact with a variety of different receptors, and they will interact with some level of dopaminergic receptor will be involved, in, mm-hmm. and then there will be serotonergic, histaminergic, and cholinergic mm-hmm. receptors. So they're bristling mm-hmm. with contacts and communication. Whereas if you look at Pima Vanserin, it doesn't have any dopaminergic, cholinergic, histaminergic, or adrenergic activity. It actually mm. is a 5-HG2A and 2C receptor, and it basically attracts with those receptors, and it acts mm-hmm. as an inverse agonist. And that's a I different see. odd term, what an inverse agonist is. It took me a little while to get around it when I first got introduced to it. And an inverse agonist, what it does is basically acts as an agonist. It binds to the receptor and shuts off the activity, as opposed to an agonist, which actually binds to a receptor and increases the activity. So I tend to right. think of this as a spigot. Yes. Our receptors are on at some basal level. And so imagine yes. a faucet kind of having a drip, 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 drip going on, and that's our basal activity for a receptor. You take yes. that, and an agonist would take the, and turn the spigot on so you would have a flush of water. Mm-hmm. An antagonist would simply prevent you from touching the spigot. And the antagonist will is to block the activity of an agonist. So it would simply prevent me from turning the spigot on. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this is an inverse agonist. It actually attaches to the spigot, 
and turns the activity off. So it's a very different way of looking at it. And, and it actually feeds into the serotonergic theory that we talked about, where you have mm-hmm. lots of the serotonergic neurons and you have an increased release of this serotonergic neuron, serotonin, on top of receptors that are the 5-HG2A and 2C, which are actually then causing an in- excitation of the glutaminergic uh, system, mm-hmm. which then in turn activates the dopaminergic system. So you're acting upstream, in other words, to turn that spigot off. I see. Right. So those upregulated 5-HT2A receptors we talked about earlier, you're blocking those here. Correct. And it's interesting, this drug does not touch D2 receptors. It, it's not a dopamine antagonist, and yet it can have antipsychotic efficacy. That's a very strange concept for many of us. It is an interesting concept even for us to think about it. And we've actually, on the Parkinson's side, seen that there is an upregulation of these receptors in those individuals with Parkinson's disease with Parkinson's disease psychosis. So we see that in a model of individuals with a progressive neurodegenerative disease that are prone to psychosis. And in the patients that have psychosis, they actually have a higher upregulation of these receptors. And yet, Mm -hmm. because it interacts with the circuitry in this kind of elegant manner, it actually turns the spigot off, resulting in reduction of psychosis. And on the Parkinson's disease uh, psychosis side, they actually did a study that looked at both the reduction in psychosis and no, it did not have any effect on the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. In fact, that was one of their main, main endpoints. It was a secondary endpoint to make sure it actually did not. So, which was helpful for us because we were very limited with existing therapy prior. Yeah. So just to be clear, as of today, pimavanserin is only approved for PDP, Parkinson's disease psychosis. And this positive data we talked about is for dementia-related psychosis in general. But it's not yet FDA approved. As you said, I guess they're going for FDA approval, and hopefully that'll come sometime soon. That is absolutely correct. It's only approved for PDP, Parkinson's disease psychosis. I can imagine then of the medications currently available, I would imagine quetiapine gets used a lot. I can imagine clozapine would be effective, but obviously that's a tough one to use. because Absolutely. Of all the- uh, so in the pre pimavastrin era, we were using quetiapine and clozapine with differing reasons for using it. So let me talk a little bit about that, actually. As somebody had said, was the best of the worst type situation. And this is another <laughs> training quotes that I had received. It's the best of the worst because as the least dopaminergic affinity for blockade. And yes, it worked on the serotonergic system. Interestingly enough, if you look at do a deeper dive on Parkinson's disease psychosis data and quetiapine, actually studies never really showed much efficacy but because mm-hmm. it was perceived safety is the reason it was used. So we used mm-hmm. a medication that wasn't as efficacious, but was safer than the rest of the antipsychotics in the older population. If I could interrupt quickly, when you say safer, you mean safer from the point of view of movement, not worsening the movement disorders. But as you said earlier, it has a lot of anticholinergic and antihistamine and other activities. Right. You're absolutely correct. I, sh- I should specify that. Safer in terms of not worsening movement or having the least impact on movement. Though, if you get into moderate doses of quetiapine and moderate doses of quetiapine for Parkinson's folks are getting into the 100 milligram doses, not necessarily the psychiatry, Mm -hmm. 3, 4, 500 milligram doses. Mm -hmm. When you get to those moderate doses for a geriatric population is when you start to get worried about causing more movement issues in an already population that's vulnerable from a movement point Mm -hmm. of view. And that's Mm -hmm. absolutely correct. Clozapine, on the other hand, is safer from the movement portions because it does not have D2 receptor affinity. Mm-hmm. But, however, because of clozapine's interesting side effect profile and the agranulocytosis, it requires weekly blood monitoring and titration yes. has to be done slowly. So we've had individuals on clozapine many, many moons ago, and many of those individuals were really frustrated with the monitoring that they had to do every week for an X number of weeks, then every two weeks, then every uh, month and then so on and so forth, and the titration being slower. If, and clozapine actually showed effectiveness in reducing Parkinson's disease psychosis, but there was mm-hmm. this large burden of making sure to check the tests every week, making sure they're coordinated between the pharmacist, the healthcare professional, and the patient, and that required a lot of work to be done, not to mention the cost of blood draws regularly. And of course, clozapine, like quetiapine, both of them are very sedating. You mentioned sedation before, and they have anticholinergic effects, which can be a big problem if you're talking about constipation in particular. Absolutely. And clozapine had another interesting issue. Clozapine, for some reason, Parkinson's patients was very much linked with silurea. Folks with clozapine had tremendous amounts of excessive saliva production, 
which then posed its own set of issues of hygiene if they were having a lot of excessive drooling or if they were having it posteriorly, the risk of choking or having aspiration, which of course is another issue Parkinson's population is vulnerable to and impacted by. I like the term best of the worst is what we've been doing, but it sounds like there may be something on the horizon here or Pimavanserin is available. It's on the market technically. Again, not yet approved for DRP, dementia-related psychosis, but theoretically, I guess one could prescribe it for that if you can get it covered. Exactly. You can prescribe it. It's will it be covered? And that comes down to insurance policies and everything. But once, and if I should say not once, if it becomes available, and then at that point, you'd be able to prescribe it for folks with dementia, and you'd be able to use this as an option for folks Because keep in mind, the older population, even though some of these may not have movement problems, some of these other folks with Alzheimer's and frontotemporal may not necessarily have the same movement problems, but they are uniquely sensitive to the sedating effects of this antipsychotic. So it is an unmet need for this individual to have something that's less sedating. Plus, keep in mind, the other issue that it does is older individuals tend to be at higher risk for developing drug-induced Parkinsonism. So they don't have Parkinson's. But because they're older, they have less of a reserve, they're more likely to not just have sedation issues, but drug-induced Parkinsonism, drug medication-induced tremors. And yes, even tardive dyskinesia can occur in the yes. population. So you have yes. an intermingling of all of these, the hint, what I call the hinterland between psychiatry and neurology, where you have psychiatric yes. medications causing neurological issues, and neurological disorders causing psychiatric issues. Yes. I can imagine the market here is much larger. We're talking about dementia is a huge market as opposed to Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease psychosis specifically. So there's a lot of people out there affected by this. Absolutely. If you look at the percentage of people, there are about 1 million Parkinson's patients. If we go with the 50% rule, that's about 50% of folks at some point will have hallucinations. That gives you an idea of what the market would look like for Parkinson's Mm -hmm. disease. When you add in Alzheimer's affects 8 to 10 million Americans, from what I understand, and mm-hmm. if you see about a 30% of those individuals having hallucinations, that is automatically a much larger group of people, but also speak to the unmet need, leaving aside Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal mm-hmm. dementia, because Lewy body mm-hmm. dementia less common, though much more likely to have psychosis, and frontotemporal mm-hmm. dementia uncommon and still having less likelihood. Between Alzheimer's dementia and vascular are being top yes. two dementias, you have a larger percentage, even though the less of them are affected than Lewy body by, by psychosis. You sure do. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you for a really lively and interesting and, and informative and practical discussion that I hope our audience benefits from. So thanks for your time, Laxman. Thank you very much, Andy. It was a pleasure being here. Likewise. And I want to thank you, the audience, and uh, please don't forget to check out some of our other podcasts and for other educational activities, you can go to our website, www.neiglobal.com. This is Dr. Andy Cutler, Chief Medical Officer of NEI, signing off. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in this NEI CME podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast's description page for a link to go online and print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation.